Okay, now this is uh, because of very many side activities, I don't uh, go that much to the sessions. This is the usual story, but uh, I think um, some points that are emerging very clearly. If I, if I, you know, in general, if I had to consider some take home messages, at least in the areas that we follow, I think one is clearly immunotherapy, obviously. I mean, we can't forget that this year the Nobel Prize for Medicine has gone to two colleagues working on, uh, let's say, the immune system and the checkpoint inhibitor. So immunotherapy inevitably is one of the hot topics. And this is very important, I think, because <coughs> we've been working on immunotherapy, including who is actually speaking for years or decades, with ups and downs and more downs and ups, to be very honest. I think now is a turning point. We said this many times in the past too, but I think it's probably true this time. <coughs> and the whole the whole story of the CAR T certainly uh, generates a lot of hype, and it's very hot topic here too. So I think that is one of the changing points that is coming here from what is presented and from side meetings that we're having too, uh, which have participated, and I can see the developments. And I think we're really in the infancy of what we are seeing, because so far as necessary the cartillo utilized as a last resort, as we do with any new drug. I mean, <coughs> excuse me, nothing really new. I mean, test some new drug, we have to go to relapse the uh, resistant patients. But the future of the treatment is going to be to use them much earlier. You know, to make a longer story, you know, there's all this discussion, how much do they cost? How feasible is it? And the answer is that they cost an enormous amount of money. Let's be very open. So how feasible is a big question mark. But the point is, as I always say, it depends where you actually can place these new... It's a drug after all. It's cellular therapy, but it's a drug. It depends where you place it. So, so far it's been in relapsed ALL for non-Hodgkin lymphomas, CLL, the data in many diseases. But the future is going to be as I see it, and I'm sure this is to include these uh, compounds much earlier. I'll give you one practical example. Example, I mean, the two approvals are in acute lymphoblastic leukemia and in diffuse RB cell lymphoma. So acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the end point of treatment has to be eradication of the disease up front. We don't wait for relapse. We would like to be sure that patients do not relapse. But if they relapse, the rescue is more complicated, it's costly, it's toxic, and not always effective, or let's say only in a proportion of patients. The goal of all treatments, including ours, uh, the GMEMA, the multi-center study we are conducting in Italy, is to induce the highest possible proportion of patients becoming MRD negative, mineral disease negative by molecular test up front. So I think that the CAR, I think, I'm sure, CAR T will move earlier. In fact, there's already been discussions for a trial using CAR T for minimal cervical disease. So the challenge will be not to use it after but to use it immediately, try to prevent a relapse. If you can show that you can cure a patient, then the issue of cost will diminish because you give less treatment. If they don't relapse, if they relapse, it means hospitalizations, it means infected complications, antibiotics, antifungal in treatment, it means a transplant, a second transplant, much more expensive. We can avoid that. So that is a challenge. We haven't discussed it yet here, but we're discussing it inside meetings. There's no data yet. Maybe some, but very scanty. But that's the future of the CAR-T. And immunotherapy is not only CAR-T. I mean, uh, developing NK cells from cord blood. We've expanded NK cells from patients. So it's a whole theme. It's not only CAR-T, but a whole theme, a whole movement that's going in that direction. So that is one, very important. Talking about minimal cerebral disease in ALL, I'll just give you one further hint. And we have, a, we have many papers here. This is one, for instance. As I told you, um, Patients with acute lymphatic leukemia, whether this is a child, and adolescent, a young or an elderly, should go enter a minimum residual disease status up front. How do we quantify this? This is mainly done by quantitative PCR, which is more sensitive than flow. I mean, I know many groups here use flow, but it's less sensitive than quantitative PCR, which we consider, we, the community considers, let's say, the standard of monitoring of disease. Problem is that quantitative PCR the laboratory sometimes, in a not small proportion, defines as a, you know, the, the final comment as a quant positive not quantifiable, which means that you have a small signal, but you can't really be sure that that is disease or not. So we are presenting here, and the paper is in press, a study where we've used more 
uh, let's say, more advanced technologies, which are the so-called digital PCR or next-generation sequencing. We've done both. In patients or in cases where the, the response was causing no quantifiable. And we present uh, the data showing that indeed, by using these more advanced technologies, we can refine the definition of MRD negativity. Why is this important? I'll give you a practical example. In our protocols, both for Philadelphia negative and Philadelphia positive ALL, the end point, the primary point, is to induce an MRD negativity. To an extent that in a Philadelphia negative, if a patient is MRD negative by quantity PCR, at two sequential uh, uh, determination, then we don't transplant the patient unless there are other prognostic factors. And then the study that we closed recently, it's about 70% being projected to be alive and possibly cured. So MRD is guiding treatment to an extent that transplant, yes, transplant, no. So if we can refine the positive and not quantifiable, you can understand the practical implication of this which goes to the Philadelphia positive too, because we're not presenting data here, but our studies for many years have been induction without chemotherapy. Only tizing kinase nibble and steroids. Now we are um, using after that, after induction, consolidation with blinatumumab. So by specific monoclonal immunotherapy, going back to the CAR T. That's a form of immunotherapy came before CAR T. The end point is there is MRD negativity molecularly without chemotherapy. Tyson candy is never the Andina tumor. So, uh, so again, this is a challenge. But in the old days, the only option for a Philadelphia body LL patient was a transplant. We're going to challenge this and probably show, hopefully, that not only many patients can be spared a transplant, but hopefully that you can cure some patients without systemic chemo, which are challenged. And the data on the MRD are therefore important. Then, other, I think one important point is emerging here. If you think about chronic lymphocytic leukemia, this is the most frequent leukemia in the Western world. We grew up with this disease knowing that it was a chronic disease, indolent, we had chlorambucil, then chemo immunotherapy. And last year, there's been all the hype of the new drugs, obviously, which are mechanism-based because they target the B cell receptor or the, or the BCL2 overexpression. I think one of the hottest things that are coming from this Congress, there are multiple studies being presented, including yesterday and today again, and there'll be late breaking, on the activity of the combined uh, uh, use of new drugs with or without an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, so without chemotherapy. And the data are looking very strong, to an extent that many patients become MRD negative, so really being extremely positive. So what can come out from this meeting is a suggestion or indication that maybe chemotherapy, I'm putting quote unquote, could be dead in CLL. We don't know, but that is what will come out of this. I personally don't think this will be the case because I think, uh, I think many things. But one, I think is extremely important. I mean, the world is very vast. It's something I'm very close to. I mean, we we're talking about CAR T before, even blinatumumab new drugs, combination, how feasible is all this? There's an issue of accessibility and to be very practical of sustainability of all this. So I travel a lot, we do education programs around the world and this, this for EHA for very, well, a very long time. The world is very vast, the real life is very different. So if here comes out the message, which is probably true, that you can get, uh, you can control disease very well and much better without chemoimmuno, how applicable is this on a worldwide scale? Miles away, yeah, who's paying for it, to be very practical. So this, I think we have to be very careful not to extrapolate too much. And we have to keep our feet down on the ground on earth and say, what can we do in the real life? This, I think, is extremely important. So that will come very strongly out of here. This is valid for the US, maybe for Central Europe, maybe for Japan and some other places. But the world is much vaster. Think of India, think of China, small countries. I mean, that is the key point. How much can this be done there? So I think we have to be very careful to say it's finished. I think uh, that goes back also to the fact that biology can guide treatment decisions. Some patients with CLL with a very good biological profile can be managed very well with chemoimmunotherapy. I think we have to keep this in mind. And talking about the real life, which I brought up, we have another presentation here on a real life in Italy with Ibrutinib and CLL in a so-called name patient program 
to see whether the data from real life are similar or not from trials, because trials are sometimes slightly biased and you don't know. And the data luckily look very good, but there's one point that I think we should keep in mind, that there is a degree of withdrawal from protocol. So many patients under long-term embrutium stop treatment for many reasons, which could be toxicity, but could be other reasons too. So this is something to keep in mind, uh, because if you stop treatment, and this is normally continued treatment, this can obviously be a problem if you're going in this direction. So this is something you have to keep in mind. Then, I mean, these I think are the, some of the most important, and the others obviously. We've done studies, I, I can bring you another example, for instance, on, uh, we did a study on uh, chronic myeloid leukemia in children, which chronic myeloid leukemia is obviously very important in adults, but it's not, it exists in children too, very rare, and we coordinate the study in Italy, we are the reference center. And you know, there's a lot of interest in CML in adults to identify which patients can stop treatment because the tazin kinase inhibitor forever is always a problem of compliance, maybe some toxicity. And there are many studies that, and we are involved in that too, how which patient can stop treatment in the adults, maybe the immune system can be triggered, there are many aspects. And if that is for the adult, just imagine for a, ch for a child, much more important because an inhibitor in a child can interfere in the growth of a child, so there are many issues. So we're presenting data here on the intermittent use of imatinib in children to try to reduce the dosing and the time on treatment, which is something that's going in in, in adults. And I must say, maybe even with the brutin and CLL, the issue of reducing dosing or giving intermittent treatment. So these are some of the aspects. I mean, I can continue and give you others, but I think oh, these are some of the important points that are emerging here. Now, one thing I would like to say that I'm old enough to remember how hematology has gone and is changing. It's always more based on rapid and precise diagnostic workup. Once you def the, define the treatment to stratify patients based on biology, different risk categories. And then there's a whole issue of giving always less systemic chemo. It's always more targeted treatment or pathways, whatever. And this is developing at an extraordinary pace. I mean, we already know that in, uh, in, in, in hematology we can control acute promyelocytic leukemia without systemic chemo. That's an acute leukemia. Chronic mild leukemia, obviously. Philadelphia positive ALL. We are controlling at many patients without chemotherapy. And more is developing. CLL now with a new drug, it's not a genetic, it's two pathways, but it's not chemotherapy. So that is a real challenge. And with whole genome sequencing and new alteration we're finding, the whole area of targeting treatment of uh, intelligent treatment is, is becoming really obvious. But then it goes again back to the sustainability of this. Can we all do it? That's a big question mark. AML. I mean, AML, let's say that, you know, AML, apart from acute promyelocytic leukemia, has been a bit of a, you know, not very exciting for many years. Um, to an extent, I always joke about this, that uh, the excitement is with Milotag, which has been around for masses of years, but poor you don't know, it's even come back, but it, that's not a change. But there are some changes. I mean, uh, the data with the FLT3 inhibitors have certainly started to shed light on the possibility. And there are now new uh, targets that are certainly being developed uh, as treatment on uh, abnormalities. So I think we are seeing at last, uh, let's say, an opening, a bit of a light at the end of a tunnel in AML. I mean, I know this is not in a clinic, it's not presented, but I know there are developments of these bispecific monoclonal antibodies, bite for. ALL, lead B lineage, the, the, the linatumum of anti-C3, anti-C19 is a, obviously most important, but that's a technology. So I know the development of bites against AML. That's still in, a, in an early phase, but I'm sure next two years we'll hear a lot about it. So I think that at last we're seeing an opening. I mean, we have the usual problem in the clinic that for ALL we have many options. If a patient relapses, you have uh, anti-C22, you have the bite, uh, so you have many options. for. AML, it's a big problem. So now, at last, we're starting to see some hope. You know what, the other thing I may just say very quickly that, uh, I mean, there's always this of transplant, uh, uh, and obviously we're always transplanting. We, I think, we hope that reduce, but everybody hopes to reduce the transplant. The transplant has certainly been uh, life-saving approach for many patients, 
A transplant is a tough issue. I'm talking about allogeneic transplant, obviously not autologous. I mean, uh, it's not easy to do. There are toxicity, which doesn't mean necessarily live or die, but you can also live with a poor quality of life. So I think that with all these immunotherapy strategies that we discussed and targeted treatment, I'm convinced, I don't know, I'm hopeful that we're going to reduce uh, the number of patients that we need to transplant, which we're already doing in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, CML was a great transplanted disease, and now we are exceptionally transplanting a CML patient that's dropped down because of thysin kinase inhibitor. CLL, we used to transplant more, and it's going down with the new drugs. And I think with the development of the CAR-T and other immunotherapy that are going earlier, that I think uh, it'd be an important challenge to reduce the transplant. So I think that is good news, although it's beginning, but we'll go in that direction.